So is this actually working? This is working? Okay, cool. Great. Right, so yeah, so here's the third lecture. So I haven't actually checked, but I think last time I ended with Sayre's conjecture, so let me just remind you about that. That was my starting point uh, for today. So I want to take a mod p Gower representation. Uh, maybe I'll allow myself algebraically closed coefficients for a moment. Uh, so let's assume that this is continuous and irreducible and odd, which if you remember means uh, that if I take a complex conjugation that determines minus one, then the conjecture is that rho bar should then be modular in the sense that it arises as the reduction mod p of some Gower representation coming from some modular form. But lambda was just a, uh, a prime of the coefficient field of f. Okay. Uh, and if I was being slightly more careful, this Gower representation at the moment uh, is probably defined to be valued in a, uh, in a finite field, but of course you can just extend scalars to f theta. Okay, so that's Sayre's conjecture. And then the idea of modularity lifting theorems was to kind of assume uh, Sayre's conjecture. try to deduce this uh, fontaine mesa conjecture. So i.e. Uh, take some representation uh, rho to characteristic zero, I'll write gl2 zp bar uh, lifting rho bar Assume that rho bar is modular, and then try to deduce that rho itself is, is modular. So it's probably not immediately apparent at all that this is a, a particularly good idea. And one reason, I mean, it might not be a good idea at all if, if you hadn't kind of gained any information in this process. So so kind of one reason this is promising, uh, the kind of reason this might be helpful, reason this might be, might be reasonable, be a reasonable way to go, is that there are lots of congruences between modular forms. This is, I guess, the theme of, of now all the courses here. What do I mean? What do I mean here? Wait. So, so if I have the Piedic Gower representation, this really is some kind of bidection. So, so rho f lambda, this really determines f. But rho f lambda bar, when I reduce mod p, this does not determine. It's not even that it doesn't determine it in general, it never determines f, and in fact, uh, there kind of exist infinitely many uh, g with, so g are going to be other eigenforms uh, with rho f lambda bar isomorphic to rho g lambda bars. Being a little careless about what, what lambda means on each side, but let's not worry about that. There exist infinitely many other eigenforms g, which have Gower representations congruent to the one coming from f. So of course, if I fix the weight and level of, of a modular form, then there are only finitely many eigenforms. So in particular, there are infinitely many possibilities for the weight or the level of g.
So let's just think, let's think briefly about uh, the issue of different levels. So think about the level aspect of things. Well, let's suppose f has, uh, has level n. Well, then we know that rho f lambda is unramified outside uh, primes dividing n and dividing p, and prime, prime p. And that implies that rho f lambda bar is also uh, unramified outside n and p. OK, well, I've said there are infinitely many possibilities of the, the weight in level in G. So the same thing is true. So if, if G has, has level M, as it were, then the same analysis applies. The analysis, the same statement applies. This is unramified outside MP. But of course, these two guy representations, if they're going to be isomorphic, it better be unramified at exactly the same times. But there's no, there's no contradiction yet as I've written it because I haven't said that this is ramified outside of these things. So in fact, if uh, f or respectively uh, g is a new form, it's new uh, of level n, respectively m. So going back to Kind of assumptions I had the last couple of days, I had really had new forms, not just eigen forms. Well, then I haven't told you this, but it's true. Then the Gal representation attached to them are uh, is a ramified. In fact, they're ramified at all the primes dividing the level. Sure. Sorry. Probably I should just. Whoa. I think that's the exact it's going to be. I don't know why it's not quite fitting today. Whereas it did. Is the, I was going to say, is the angle going to be the issue? Let's see. Is that looking more weak? I had the physics wrong. Is that looking better? Good. Thanks. OK. OK, so what was I saying? These are ramified at exactly uh, the primes. Dividing NP, respectively MP. Okay, so so if these two representations are going to be isomorphic mod P, they're going to have to be ramified at exactly the same primes. So so if rho f lambda bar is isomorphic to rho g lambda bar, but m equals n, then so m is not equal to n, then there must be uh, primes L to which, uh, for example, well, the ramification is going to change, so for which maybe rho g lambda, if I restrict to a decomposition group at L, this is ramified. But on the other hand, once I go mod p, this is not ramified. Okay, that's now what must be going on. If I'm going to have congruence between modular forms of different levels, then since the ramification is different in characteristic zero, but they're going to be congruent mod p, the ramification is going to have to kind of vanish for some of these primes when I go mod p. Well, thankfully, uh, this can absolutely happen. This can certainly happen. And in fact, uh, it can be understood extremely explicitly. I'm not going uh, to go through examples or anything, but you can you can maybe do the exercise of just thinking about the one-dimensional case. So if you think about the one-dimensional case, I'm asking: uh, Can there be characters which are unramified mod p, but which are ramified in characteristic p? I think that then certainly yes, they can. Okay, I mean you're 
you can, you can even take the characters to be trivial mod p, and then I'm asking to have characters which are, are valued in the things which are one mod p. So this can absolutely happen, and in fact, if we fix uh, if we fix f, then there will be uh, infinitely many. L such that uh, rho f lambda bar for a strict equivalence to group of L, this uh, this has this local characterization has ramified lists. So I should say it's I mean th this can happen, but it doesn't always happen, right? I mean if you think about the one dimensional case, there is a condition um, on L and P. For the existence of ramified lists. In certain pairs L and P, there really aren't any unramified characters that have ramified lists. But on the other hand, it turns out if you fix, fix F and you fix this mod P representation, then there are certainly infinitely many possibilities where at least this could happen locally. So then the question is, is how do we understand how what happens globally? So it's all very well me saying, I mean, what this statement is, is saying at the moment is that there's no local obstruction that you can see to the existence of congruences to, to modular forms of, of higher level. But maybe you actually, I mean, the, the fact that I can't see a local obstruction doesn't mean there isn't a local, there isn't some global obstruction. Well, I think the philosophy is, is that the only obstructions are local. So what does this mean? Uh, if we fix f, and we want to know uh, for which uh, which levels m there exists g of level M with uh, with rho g lambda bar is equal to rho f lambda bar. The answer uh, can be phrased uh, purely in terms of uh, the existence of the existence of lifts. Of the rho f lambda bar restricted to decomposition groups at L, essentially for L dividing M uh, with particular ramification properties. So, e.g., let's suppose f has level n and L divides. N, maybe let's so suppose that L exactly divides N, then uh, it should be, there should be some G of level uh, N over L with rho G lambda bar isomorphic to rho F lambda bar uh, if and only if rho F lambda bar when I restrict the decomposition group of L. But if this happened, if G has level, if L exactly divides N, and now G has level N over L, then L doesn't divide the level of G. So then the Gal representation for G would have to be unnarrified, and so the Gal representation of F would have to be unnarrified. So that's, so this implication in this direction, that if this G exists, then you have this, this unramified condition, that's immediate because G even encourages the zero of the Galvin station is unramified. But the hard direction is the, conver is, is the converse direction. That if you have this local condition, then you should be able to remove this L from the right level. So this statement here is what's called level lowering. So this was part of says. so I mean, I've been saying there's something called says conjecture, uh, which is true. 
But Sayers conjecture traditionally had a, uh, a weak form and a strong form. In the strong form of Sayers conjecture, he really spelled out things like this. So he said, not just if I have a mod p representation that comes from a modular form, he tried to really pin down which modular form it was. And this is one of the, the kind of parts of what he, what he was saying. And I think people were originally, quite people were kind of skeptical about this because, well, uh, in particular, uh, this implies that then rho f lambda bar has a global lift, has a, well, has a lift to characteristic zero. is just rho g lambda, which is unramified at L. So, so this statement here now, if you think about this statement, this statement doesn't mention a Gal representation. So, sorry, it doesn't mention a modular form. It does mention a Gal representation. Uh, so you could phrase this statement, you could, you could now just say, let's have a purely group theoretic question. Let's just completely forget I haven't mentioned modular forms. So let's take a global mod p gal representation. Let's say it's unramified at some prime, and then I'm going to say, does it exist? Does there, does there exist some lift to characteristic zero which has this ramification property? And in fact, even if I just, if I actually don't even mention that, I go back to the which says original conjecture. That even let's just say that's a global, there's a global mod p representation. Can we lift it to characteristic zero? I mean, in general, you certainly can't do that kind of thing. And now I'm asking a much more refined version. I'm saying, can you lift it to characteristic zero and specify all kinds of local properties? And if you think about this just as a question in terms of group theory, if I just take a, a group and a, a mod p representation, and then I say, now I'm going to look at its behavior when I restrict some subgroups, and I'm going to demand that there's a lift of this representation that has all these properties of, this, of the subgroups. I mean, that's in general, you just can't do that. It's completely not possible in some general statement. So, uh, so, so kind of from the perspective of uh, group theory, This is a. Uh, this is pretty mysterious. So, I guess this is one of the first examples, if you like, of. I mean, it's, this is kind of an example of the of the of, of this really tight connection between the modular forms and the Gal representations, and then really kind of giving you non-obvious things. So, like, I mean. I should say similarly, it's a rather vague statement, but similarly, uh, if you think of this, uh, the statement about modular forms, okay, similarly, I mean, maybe it's even more mysterious in some sense. Sure, similarly, it's even more with very good English, but uh, so what you can do is you can translate uh, this this unramified condition uh, that uh, that rho f lambda bar restricted to the group but L is unramified. To a to a condition just on uh, what was I calling these guys like a f of l if you like the Fourier coefficient of l so some condition on the congruence to that uh, of uh, some function and like some kind of polynomial of this having some congruence mod p you can make this this translation using the local angles correspondence uh, and then. And then sort of state a purely uh, a purely modular form. Well, this is really not going to turn into a sentence, but a purely modular form world conjecture. Uh, so what do I mean by that? What I mean is you can take a modular take an eigenform f and then say if it's Fourier coefficient L satisfies some strange condition, then there's another modular form G this different level which is congruent to it mod p. 
So you can ask that kind of thing as well. And I think in some sense it even looks more mysterious when you when you phrase things like that. Okay, so so this is some philosophy. So kind of historically, uh, results like this. So I mean, this this is I say this is some reasonable philosophy, but this is now essentially completely understood for these modular forms. So results like this. Uh, like went into the proof of uh, the kind of Sayers conjecture or much earlier the proof of Fermat's last theorem and so on. So, so this level lowering result, in fact, mostly proved by, by Ribbit, I guess, and was the kind of the key thing in reducing Fermat's last theorem to Reducing Fermat's last theorem to to uh, modularity of elliptic curves, but but now uh, we kind of we can actually deduce uh, level lowering, or if I made instead of if I increase the ramification, call it level raising uh, from uh, these kind of modularity lifting theorems. In a way that I think is more a transparent way, it's a, I think it's a, it's kind of so. What do I mean by it being more transparent? Well, I mean the way I've stated this, and as, as I said, if I translated this condition instead of being a Galois condition, if I translate it into a modular forms condition, I think it becomes much more obscure. But the the original proofs were much more using this these modular forms conditions, and nowadays we can actually basically prove it in a, in a kind of way you might like to prove it. So have some machine that gives you a way to lift these more peak out citations to characteristic zero in, in some, some completely concrete way, and then deduce that they come from modular forms as part of these modularity lifting theorems. So the reason I'm kind of saying this is, is this is going to be uh, hopefully what's going on in the, in the project presentation on Wednesday. So that's one reason I'm talking about it. The other reason is that uh, this idea of having all these congruences between these modular forms and studying the way they change is exactly how we prove these modularity lifting theorems. So let me try and now say something about that. Maybe I should start looking at my notes since I've used half my time without looking at what I'm supposed to be talking about. Uh, right, so I'm three lines down the page, that's great. So, uh, okay, so, so maybe let's move on to, to Mazur's idea. So Mazur's idea was, as I say, if you think historically, says uh, what Sayer was saying sort of suggested that there were gonna be all these congruences nicely indexed between the modular form side and the Galois side. And we know for lots of reasons that there are lots of congruences. I mean, it was already understood that there were lots of congruences between modular forms, so that means there are lots of congruences between Gower representations. So his idea was to, to study the congruences uh, between Gower representations in uh, some kind of systematic way. And how do we do that? So, so let's maybe now go back to having finite coefficients. Let's fix this, fix some representation like this, which is absolutely irreducible. So I should probably remark, I mean, I discussed this in the notes at some length, but the, the issue of going between like finite coefficients and FP bar coefficients, or between going for periodic representations being valued in a finite extension of QP versus QP bar, these things are actually all equivalent. So that statement is basically saying that if I have a representation, for example, valued in GL2 FP bar, then it descends to some GL2, some finite field. And that turns out to be easy because uh, this guy is compact and the FP bar, that thing is discrete and it's supposed to be something continuous, so the image has to be finite. Once it's finite, it descends to, obviously, it's valued in GL2 of some finite field. And periodically, the same thing is true as well. It turns out, I mean, that uses some, that uses the bare category theorem, but again, if you have a representation, the compact group valued in GLN of QP bar, then it's actually valued in GLN of 
time for vector infinity t. So I'm going to move back and forth between those statements. And the reason I want to go back to sort of finite fields and uh, finite rings in a minute is that quite often when you're making arguments, you actually want to, for example, deal with complete rings. So dealing with QP bar or something is maybe not so nice. Okay, so that's why I'm going to do this. So let's let uh, let's kind of fix uh, O the ring of integers of E, E over QP, uh, to some finite extension with the residue field of, of O being F. Okay, and let's, so let's just imagine this is some sufficiently large ring of integers. And again, just basically for sort of technical reasons to do with completions and so on, I'm going to just assume that whenever I lift this gap representation to characteristic zero, it really is landing in, in O rather than in sort of GP bar. Okay, so let's let let's define some category of, of rings. So it turns out that to study the, I mean, I want to kind of lift. I've just said I want to look at all my representations as kind of lifting to GL two of O. But I'm going to kind of try and put those representations together in some family. And to do that, I'm going to need to consider some slightly bigger rings. So let's let this category be the category of complete uh, local Euclidean. O algebras with uh, the residue field F. Okay, so so I should find some more paper. So I'll start writing on the tours. Okay, this one feels great. So so examples are things like. O, or you should imagine like a power series ring in finitely many variables over O. That's the kind of thing I'm thinking about. And then a, uh, a lift of row bar is a, it's a rep well, it's a continuous representation. Uh, row from G GQ to GL2 of R, where R is an object of uh, this category. So just lifting to O or to maybe O to a power series ring or something, uh, such that a kind of row modulo the maximal ideal of R. So if I just reduce this guy modulo the maximal ideal, well, then I have. By definition, the residue field of these these rings is F, so I get something valued in F, and I can just ask that this is isomorphic to uh, or even equal to row bar. Okay, and then a deformation. I'm going to talk more about deformations than lifts. Of row bar is uh, an equivalence class. lifts where the equivalence relation is that uh, that rho is equivalent to kind of a rho a inverse where a is just a uh, a two by two matrix which is trivial mod p trivial mod the max ideal so a is just an element of the kernel of, of gl2 r Okay, so, so liftings really are kind of sort of physical representations, if you like, and then deformations are just representations up to conjugacy, which is a pretty reasonable notion. Okay, well, and then the fact, or the theorem, due to Mazer, the point of this definition is that the, uh, the functor that takes R to the set of deformations to R is actually a representable functor. So there exists. A universal deformation so i.e. Uh, there's kind of an R universal in the object an object of these one of these one of these rings and a deformation 
now I'm going to write something slightly false. So I'm going to write something false for the moment and I'll correct it afterwards. So don't interrupt me just yet. Um, so it's just a pair like this, as such that uh, if I keep my notation with my notes, so if rho is any lift, It's any deformation, sorry. Then there exists a unique map from uh, this R universal you know, from theta to R, such that rho is just obtained from the universal thing by composition with theta. Okay, so there's some nice universal representation, which you should probably imagine is valued in maybe like some power series ring, so that any specialization of that is is a lift. You know, any specialization, for example, to O is is a lifting, and all the liftings come in this way. When I say lifting, I mean deformation. So, okay. So why is this not quite true? Well, there's a bit of a problem at the moment, which is that I, in my category, I, I define the uh, the objects of this category to be Noetherian rings, and in fact, at the moment, this is a little too big, and I probably won't have something Noetherian. So this probably this result is true, but without the Noetherian hypothesis won't be holding. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of retroactively make a definition, which is let's have QS is let's sorry let's fix S a uh, finite set of primes uh, containing uh, P and the primes. Where row bar is ramified. And then let's let Q of S be the maximal extension of Q and ramified outside S. And then let's uh, let's let G Q S be the Gower group of Q S over Q. And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to go up and retrospectively put that in. And now the point is just that that Gower group is a, is a slightly more finite object than the other one. And that now means that this, this, uh, oops, this universal representation that is being valued there, that this representation, this, this universal deformation ring is now actually an ethereum. So if I didn't put that but just had GQ, then I would have got a universal ring, but it would not have been the theory. Okay, so, so our universal kind of uh, it knows about uh, every lift of row bar in characteristic zero. So whenever I've said let's have that we want to kind of build some representation with particular properties, such representation just corresponds to a point of this ring. So the kind of, if you like, the goal, this is Mazur's idea, is to kind of understand this ring. The idea being, I mean, perhaps if you could like, for example, explicitly say what this ring was, then you'd be in very good shape because then you would really understand all the liftings to to zero, everything at once, and maybe you could then just say uh, exactly exactly what they all were, and then you'd be able to just say that they all came from modular forms. That might be a, some kind of dream of what you might hope to do. Well, there's a, some slight problem at the moment, which is that it actually, it's still a bit big. So, it's kind of, too big for our purposes. Our purposes is to understand the Gauss representations coming from modular forms. And the problem is, if you think about it, uh, to kind of, if we go back to this Fontaine Mazur conjecture, we had these rho, so I'm going to say it's valued in O, and it had to satisfy some conditions which were, you know, it was continuous, uh, odd, 
not how you write odd, not how you write anything. Uh, odd, if it's unramified, uh, outside a finite set of primes, But it was also had this other condition, it had to be this condition of being Durham at P. Okay. So at the moment, the representations that we're considering, if we consider kind of all the representations coming, just all the representations that lift, uh, lift our row bar, well, some of these conditions are okay. So the condition of being odd is okay, um, because probably I know I said this, but certainly in my head, the prime P is always bigger than two. So if we know the representation comes from a modular form, if we're assuming certain conjecture, then the mod p representation is odd, so the characteristic zero representation is odd. Now that I'm using this, this GQS instead, then every representation I'm considering is only allowed to ramify at the primes in S. So it's unramified at only a finite set of primes. But this condition of being Durham at P is not being taken care of at all. So our universal is, is too big in the sense that uh, kind of our universal uh, also parameterizes uh, the representations which are not Durham at P. And those representations, these representations definitely don't come from modular forms. Provably don't come from modular forms. So then the idea is to kind of cut this universal ring down to take uh, the Durham condition into account. Because now I'm claiming that I'm going to make some study of this ring and and deduce things, but the problem at the moment is it's just the wrong ring. It understand it has too many Gower representations. It doesn't doesn't understand this condition, and that condition is really somehow, in some sense, the really the, the most crucial condition. It's really the delicate one that that really tells you whether you're coming from modular forms or whether you're coming from something much more general. Okay, so how do we take account of this condition? Well, if the condition is this, when I said Durham at P, it was this condition just purely on the local Gower representation. So you restricted the decomposition group at P, and then there was some complicated thing that I totally didn't define coming from Piatic Hodge theory. So that, what that suggests is that we need to study the, uh, the representations coming from this universal ring. We need to study those on the decomposition group. So let me make an assumption. It's an unnecessary assumption, but it will simplify what I'm saying. That when I take my mod P representation and restrict the decomposition group, let's assume that this is is also absolutely irreducible. So if I don't assume absolute irreducibility, then it's not true that this universal deformation exists. There's, kind of, there's basically an issue that the mod p representation has too many automorphisms. Uh, you can get around that basically by keeping account of the basis, but I'm not going to do that. So let's just make this assumption here as well. Well, then there exists a, uh, a universal Deformation. Uh, what should I call it? Maybe R. Maybe let's call it row P universal from GQP to GL two. Maybe let's call it R P of, uh, of of this local deformation. Yeah. Okay. So now this understands all of the all of the local deformations. So it's all the deformations of this local representation. And then we could ask, what do the, uh, what's the, the locus of Durham representations inside here? So now I get to draw a picture. So, so what you could imagine is that 
and this is typically the case, is what RP is going to look like. RP will typically look like a power series ring. Okay, three variables. I think. Uh, so that's not quite true, but this will be true after fixing determinants. So let me kind of draw some picture of spec RP. Maybe after we converted P, that's just some kind of three-dimensional thing. So let's just draw a cube. That being probably as, as good an, an approximation as any to what a three-dimensional chaotic space might look like. And then this Durham condition is supposed to be, there's supposed to be lots of points, some point, each point inside here is giving me a, a representation. So a point meaning kind of a, you know, if you like, a, a, a maximum ideal. Well, not maximum ideal, but a, an O point of here. It corresponds to a Gal representation, and I can ask what the Durham locus looks like. I think it probably looks something like, like this. Okay, so this is the Durham locus. So it's a mess. I mean, it's a lot more of a mess than that. That's not really doing it justice. So the point is, is that somehow a union of of infinitely many components, which are of, of, uh, of co-dimension two inside here, so it's an infinite union of one-dimensional components, which is dense, and it's got some kind of horrible fractal structure, okay? So, so it's a kind of dense union of one-dimensional components, which is not such good news uh, in some sense. We're trying to isolate this rather delicate condition, and we're trying to do algebra having some kind of horrible, horrible thing inside it. It's not so good. So the idea is to just kind of fix maybe some finite set of components, and then you might have something more reasonable. So maybe I can then draw my cube again. cube, but now the components, so I have a note in the margin saying use colored pens, but I then didn't bother to ask about getting some colored pens, but maybe let's just imagine we just have sort of three, three components or something. So this would be something rather more reasonable. So, so what I, that sounds like I'm doing something a bit random, just fixing some finite set of components. So what I actually really do is I, how do I do this? We kind of impose a kind of stronger condition. than just being Durham. And really I'm just you know throwing words out here because I'm not going to define anything. But for example, this is the condition we use in the notes, we could impose the condition of crystalline with fixed Hodge tape weights. In fact, this is exactly the, the condition that's considered in the notes with some further restrictions. And the nice thing is, is that when you then, so this imposes, so I'm imposing some condition on local, local Gal representations. I could also impose it on global Gal representations. And if I did that, I could ask, if I believe this one time major conjecture that I'm also imposing conditions on modular forms. And this, con this condition translates very nicely into the world of modular forms. What does it translate to? Uh, the fixed Hodge tape weights tra translates, as you might hope, to uh, the weight being fixed. And this crystalline condition just corresponds to the modular forms having level not to be all IP. So somehow, the Gal representation, the global Gal representation away from P, the ramification was telling you what the level is, and at P, somehow it's telling you both the weight and the level. So that's what's going to go on. So let's, if we now fix, uh, if we now fix those things, then locally we have some kind of sensible condition. So locally we can now maybe study these, these components. So maybe, maybe I want that picture again. So, 
so let's have my components. So this, this union of components is now going to be maybe what I'll think of as being spec. Maybe I'll call it RP of K. So now RP of K is the universal a deformation ring for uh, crystalline representations over here with Hodge Tate weights at zero and k minus one, and that should correspond to modular forms of weight. I mean, it shouldn't literally correspond in the sense that these, these representations, this picture here is just a local representation, and modular forms are going to correspond to global representations, but I mean global representations are going to restrict them to the local thing, uh, look, on, look like they're on here. So I have about one minute left, so what do I want to, to end up by saying? So, okay, so given so given a global representation, we obtain a local one uh, by restriction to the decomposition group, with restriction to GQP. And that means, if you think about what that means in terms of these, these spaces, that means I'm going to get a map from spec of R universal to spectrum of RP. Okay. This guy here is the moduli space of global, de global deformations. This is the moduli space of local deformations and restriction to the gut station takes a point here and gives me a point here. And that means that I can then define uh, kind of R universal with K spec of this, at least, to be the inverse image of this RP of K. Well, in more ring theoretic language, I'm just going to define it to be the, the tensor product uh, R universal let's say the RP with RP of K, which is just a quotient of the deformation ring, and then kind of R universal of K Should really be uh, parameterizing gamma representations uh, corresponding to modular forms of weight k level prime to p kind of level level dividing S, meaning that level is only divisible by primes in my set S. That's still, if you think about it, that's still infinitely many modular forms in theory, but there's also this condition that the Gauss representation has to be congruent to our fixed one mod P. And that means that in fact, you expect this to give you the sort of finitely many modular forms which you've got some control over. And so tomorrow what I'll talk about is how we then actually study this ring. Um, and I'll show you I mean, now you have to think about this global picture and how it lives inside this, how it maps to this local one. So tomorrow I'll draw some more pictures and kind of say what the, what this Taylor-Wells uh, method then gives us for these modularity-lifting theorems. Okay, so I'll stop there.